Hello and welcome to Byju's IAS. Yesterday we had India and New Zealand semi-finals. Majority of the cricket pundits and even bookies would have a safe bet on India to win. But unfortunately, India lost, sending a billion people in the mode of grief. But let's take a look at this picture. Even a small gap or a distance to one's own goal can make big dreams and billion hopes shatter let's draw an example for our own preparation from yesterday's match six wickets lost all of us were praying for rain gods to shower at start when the jains of the indian cricket batting team did not explode we lost all hope then comes bits and pieces player sir jadeja who rekindled billion hopes everyone would have criticized india without fight but a strong fight and a comeback means we are standing by the team in the tough times likewise work so hard that it does not matter whether one wins or loses slog till the last even if one does not win there'll be hands and voices to lend support during one's bad phase leave no stone unturned do everything possible to crack this exam with no excuses for your family you might be the dhoni carrying billions of hopes give your best and let destiny take its own course of action remember this no one expects afghanistan to win the world cup but they expect india to since you have picked this exam there will be pressures expectations cheers and also tears if you don't win just like there are spectators in cricket who will be cheering for you there would also be people who would be booing for you it ultimately times down to how you balance your mind as well as keep up your composure it does not matter when you succeed but all that matters is you succeed thousand hours of private sacrifice will surely fetch you minutes of public applause if you are ready to embrace pain discipline your schedule meet your daily target and have firm grit and determination the tears of happiness will roll from your eyes to plant a kiss on your cheeks and take you through the doors of bliss never give up let's get started and look into the first article the first article is speaking about code on occupation safety health and working conditions bill of 2019 what is the context the union cabinet has approved a bill this bill will seek to merge about 13 different labor laws into a single code when you look at the current picture there are different labor laws for different types of associations all these different laws will be clubbed gelled into one single law and this single law will be enforced going forward so this particular law will be used by all employers organizations institutions as well as establishments which currently house 10 or more workers let's try and understand what this code or this bill all about according to this particular code every unit employing 10 or more employees shall have to register with the government of india so in case there is an institution an organization which has 10 people or anything more than that this organization will have to register itself with the government of india so the minute it registers with the government of india this employer will have to ensure that the workplace is free from all types of hazards which means this should not cause any injury or harm or any diseases to the employees so the employer will have to ensure that there is no harm that is perforated to this employees so he will have to comply by all occupational safety and health standards that are mentioned under this code that are mentioned under the regulations the bylaws and the orders that have been come down by the government of india further every employer shall also ensure that there is periodical medical examination and all the prescribed standards are met by the employer in the manner that has been prescribed by the government of india which means that the code makes it mandatory for all the employers to provide 
free annual medical checkup so that this will be an advantage for the employee that is coming up from the employer organization or an institution so there'll be periodic medical checkup and this periodic medical checkup and its charges will be borne by the employer further in case there is a woman who is employed by this particular organization and if she is working beyond 7 pm and before 6 am such a woman will also have to be provided all safety mechanisms she will also have to be provided with all working conditions as stipulated by the government of india and for all this the major part is consent has to be taken by that particular woman so first take the consent of the woman and also ensure that every safety aspect of for that particular woman is also met by the employer so these are some of the important things as mentioned under this particular bill now in order to make sure that this is a successful attempt and in order to ensure that relevant feedback is given to the government of india timely and periodically there is an organization that is set up and that is the national occupational safety and health advisory board the central government under this will constitute this particular board where it would be able to advise on all matters whether it is with respect to the standards the rules and the regulations that the employer will have to maintain and sustain and these advices given by this particular board will be told to the government of india and the government of india will further enforce all these important rules that have been recommended by this particular board when you look at this particular bill the code will be applicable to all type of trades first we discussed it is applicable for all type of establishments which has 10 or more workers so it also means it is applicable to the it employees it is applicable to the service sector the manufacturing sector as well as all types of trades and establishment so it is even applicable to the mines as well so understand the scope of this particular bill is employed to all different sectors including the primary where there are 10 or more people the manufacturing sector as well as the service sector as well so this is what this article all about now let's look into the next article this article says india can repel article 370 at will says the center this article is basically speaking about article 370 of the indian constitution and 35a these two important issues have already been covered we have a video for the same which is recorded by sarmat sir a link for the same will be provided in the description box so kindly look into it anything else in the future which can be added upon will be discussed but as of now whatever is the core area is all covered under the video so kindly look into that particular video now let's look into the next article this article here is speaking about the advanced short range air to air missile system let's look into the context the indian air force is looking to adopt a new european visual range air to air missile across its fighter fleet so this particular missile will be employed in its stages as well as su-30 flighter jets now the question is why was the government of india trying to introduce this missile system into the aircraft that we currently have when we look at the background, there was a growing gap between India and Pakistan when it comes to its fighter aircraft as witnessed during the Balakot dogfight. Therefore, in order to bridge the missile gap between the Indian Air Force and the Pakistani Air Force which displayed an edge, superiority with better weapons and which also had higher standoff range, that is why India has taken this particular move. So what is this standoff range? So basically, this is nothing but the distance from which a missile can be fired without actually entering the attack range of that particular enemy. Now let's take an example to understand what the standoff range basically is. Let's say we have an aircraft. There is also an enemy aircraft. We have a missile as well. So this missile which is attached to the aircraft is fired from this particular aircraft. So without actually reaching the territory of this particular region where the current aircraft is hosted in the enemy territory this missile would be able to launch on itself and also neutralize this particular target so what is the advantage here it is not going into the target range of this particular aircraft 
Why? Because in case it goes into this particular target range, this would be able to neutralize the aircraft. So without venturing into that particular zone, what it does is it would be able to fire this missile and kill and neutralize the enemy aircraft. This is what is meant by standoff range, which basically means the distance from which a missile can be fired without actually entering the attack range of the enemy. So now let's also understand some key important facts with respect to the advanced short range air to air missile. The missile is designed and built by MBDA United Kingdom. It is weighing about 88 kg. It is a within visual range dominance weapon with a range of about 25 km. Kindly remember the range. It would be the first over the wing launch missile in the IAF inventory. All missiles are now fired from under the wing. It is currently in service in the Royal Air Force as well as the Royal Australian Air Force as well. So what we have to understand is when it is getting launched from this particular aircraft, it will be able to sense that particular target information with all the aircraft sensors, the radars, the intermounted site that are currently mounted on this particular aircraft. Now let's look at important practice question in relevance to this particular article. Which of the following missiles are currently matched with the country of manufacture? Israel, Python, Germany, Dale Iris, American, Raytheon M, 9X side window. The answer to this is 1, 2, 3. All the three missiles are correctly matched with the country of manufacture. So kindly remember this. This can be asked in your preliminary examination as well. Now let's look into the next article. This article here says a demographic wind of opportunity. When you look at the context, the United Nations recently released the world population prospects. This was published by the Population Division of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. When when you look at this particular report, it has come up with certain key facts. Let's look at what are these key stats that has been given by the United Nations. When it comes to the Indian population, the report has stated that in the year 2019, India has an estimated population of about 1.37 billion and China has a population of about 1.43 billion. And by the year 2027, India's population is going to surpass that of China. This is what the United Nations report has gone on to say. It further said, according to the estimates, India is expected to add about 273 million people by the year 2050 and it will remain the most populated country by the end of 21st century as well. So what we got to understand is the fact that this particular report by the United Nations is projected every two years. So it comes out with this particular report every two years. Now let's look at one of the important data. When you look at the year 2015, it came up with this particular report and it went on and said that India would be overtaking China's population by the year 2022. So this is a periodic report which happens every two years. It was published in 2013, 2015, 17 as well as it is published in 2019 as well. When you look at the stats given in the year 2019, what it says is it is not in the year 2022 but India will be surpassing China in the year 2027. When you look at this particular contrast theory, what it goes on to say is that United Nations has revised the India's expected population size and this is due to the decline in the fertility rate. Why? Because all these population projections are developed using existing population and by adjusting the number of births, deaths as well as migration. So because the deaths, births and migration can change over a period of time, that is why United Nations keeps changing this particular cycle every two years. And this particular report is also established and published every two years. Now let's look at the global picture. This particular global picture says it is projected to increase by another 2 billion people by the year 2050 from the current 7.7 .7 billion in 2019 to 9.7 billion 
30 years down the line. And also, when it comes to the global fertility rate, it fell from 3.2 births per woman in 1990 to 2.5 in 2019 and it is projected to decline further to 2.2 in 2015. And when we look at the other important stat, in 2018 for the first time, persons aged above 65 years or over worldwide outnumbered children under 5 years of age. When it comes to this particular key fact, this can be an important factor for your preliminary examination. Until now, you have always seen that the number of 5 year children are more than the 65 years. For the first time in the 2018, the number of 65 years are more than the number of 5 year children. But when it comes to India, the children under age 5 still outnumber the over 65 population who are projected to overtake the under 5 group between 2025 and 2030. Kindly remember, this is a global information and for India, it is still the same. That is the number of 5 years are more compared to the 65 years. And also when it comes to the sex ratio, males are projected to continue to outnumber the females until the end of the century but the gap that is currently is there will also be reduced. So currently what you will see is it is the male who have been dominant over the female in the sex ratio as well. Now this article further has spoken about the population control. It speaks about three important issues. What it says is on the first issue, it speaks about the government initiatives. It says that government being democratic, India following the democratic model has number of initiatives it has taken in the past. What are these? It might be in the form of restriction of maternity leave or other maternity benefits after they have had two kids or it can be in the form of disqualification from the panchayat elections as number of state governments have taken in the past. Let's take a simple example. Recently when you look at the state of Assam, Assam also came up with a particular law. So what does this law basically say? It says that any person in case he has had more than two children, he'll be disqualified from contesting the panchayat elections, local body elections or he'll not be able to have government jobs as well. So government has taken number of initiatives in the past. It has also come up with minor incentives when it comes to sterilization as well. Has it bore the fruits? Yes, as well as no. In few circumstances, it has been an advantage. In few circumstances, it has not made any change. When you look at why it has not made any change when it comes to the government initiatives, it is due to the personal preference for the child. It is basically a belief that the elderly, that is during the old age, it is the sons and the daughters who will stand by them and take care of them and not the government as well as the government incentives given by the government. At the same time, the government has also come up with and initiated certain voluntary acts. What are these voluntary acts? It basically means it is encouraging the government rather than coming up with some penal actions, rather than enforcing certain things, it is encouraging people to take up this initiative so that there is family planning, they are restricting themselves to a single kid or even two kids and not anything more than that. In order to come up and initiate such a move, the government in the past has come up with some landmark advertisements as well. What are these? One of the advertisement was Pati Patni Kare Vichar Swast Nari Swast Parivar which means this was a particular program that was come up by the National Rural Health Mission under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. So this particular advertisement that was given by the government of India basically highlighted female participation, joint decision making and interspousal discussion for family planning which means this would ultimately impact both of them that's why they wanted both of them to discuss negotiate and also come up with this family planning measure there have been other set of advertisements as well where celebrities are also bought in so that these celebrities are engaging with the people in order to ensure the population explosion does not happen in India on the third front what this particular article also speaks is how population has to be incorporated in broader developmental policies. 
kindly remember this is the view of the author we are just replicating the same this is not the view of us according to the author the 15th finance commission is expected to use the 2011 census the minute this came out there were number of south indian states which came and agitated against this particular move why because let's take the examples of kerala or let's take the examples of tamil nadu as well these are south indian states which have ensured that population explosion does not happen they have number of schemes and mechanisms they have ensured that education is perforated to every person so with this education a number of programs for population control these states were able to control the population so when you look at the total fertility rate it is about 1.5 to 1.6 in the south indian states and when it comes to the North Indian state, the total fertility rate is beyond 2.1. So North Indian states have failed. That is why these South Indian states say that these people should not be given incentives and South Indian states will be facing the brunt because of the population explosion. So this had led to ociferous protests from the South Indian states as they feel it is being penalized for better performance in reducing fertility. When you look at other key important statistics, let's take the example of the population growth from the year 1971 to the year 2011 when you look at the census it clearly goes on and says the population of Kerala grew by about 56 percent but when you look at the north indian states of Bihar Uttar Pradesh as well as Madhya Pradesh they grew by about 140 percent so all these states coming up and showing their anger against the central government for taking this particular reference in the 15th finance commission is fair and fine according to the author but what the author also says is there has to be a new look that the south indian states will have to look at how yes there have been issues but going forward the south indian states will have to give it a new dimension to it why there are number of people who are from bihar there are number of people who are from uttar pradesh there might be people from madhya pradesh as well these people have left their hometowns and they have come to south india these people are working in that particular state of kerala tamil nadu karnataka so on and so forth these people have started working in that particular state they also pay tax for that particular state government they pay professional taxes for that so what it ultimately means is incomes generated by these workers in one state may also act as tax revenues to that particular state so the state is also growing with it so these people may be coming from that particular state to the south indian state and they are adding value to this particular system so what's wrong in taking the 2011 census in the 15th finance commission is what the author is asking another key important argument that the author goes about speaking is currently when you see at south india there is a total fertility rate which is decreasing and in north india it is more than 2.1 what it also means is there is a continuous decline in the population for the current generation they would be able to manage all types of activities because the total fertility rate is comparatively good but going forward what you will see is that there will be more number of older people who are more than 65 in south india than in north india it is at this particular moment that people from north india will be asked to move to south india and it is these people who will be working for the south indian states so what the author calls for is this type of fear that the current south indian states have should be completely removed why because in the future the current laggards that is the Bihar the Uttar Pradesh the Madhya Pradesh will be the greatest contributors of the future for everyone because their total fertility rate will come down in the future and when these South Indian states will require people that is when North India would be able to send all these people to South India to help their brothers and sisters so what the author calls for is in order to make this demographic division a successful mission what we need is to invest in the education the health of the workforce in North India for which we need more funds for which the 15th Finance Commission will have to take the 2011 census more the money that is being given to the population of the North India then they will become a demographic dividend which will become a human asset a human resource which can be utilized properly is what this article all about now let's look into the next article this article here is speaking about one of the important movements that is me too let's try and understand 
what this author is trying to express about. In the mid and late 1800s, social movements in Europe were galvanized. It demanded parity, equal rights, egalitarian society, which was devoid of all gender bias for the women. It was during this period that the very word feminism was born, tracing its origins to the French as well. So the author here is trying to say how the concept of feminism was ultimately born. Then she takes some of the examples as well. She takes the example of suffrage movement in Britain to elaborate it further. There was a particular period of time in the 20th century where women were not treated in equality to men. Why? Because there was oppression, because there was suppression and what was happening? They were not given the right to vote. And ultimately what happens? Number of women come up together, they galvanize their voice and what they do is fight for their women's right to vote. So what happens here? All these women come up together, they voice their opinion and that is when the Britain comes up with a particular law which is called as the Representation of the People's Act of 1918. Until this particular act was passed, women were not allowed to vote in the general elections and after this particular representation of the People's Act was passed in the year 1918, it allowed women to vote in the general elections for the very first time. Going forward, there was another movement called as the Gender and Development Approach. What is this Gender and Development Approach that we witness during the 1980s? So what happens during this particular period is, number of women realize all of a sudden that there have been gender bias. There have been certain compartmentalization and segregation. How? There is something called as men's work, there is something called as women's work, there is segregation. So there is a man who goes out, he works in general, he goes out and earns the money and there is a woman who has to take care of the kids, who has to do all the household chores and she is not paid for anything. So there is segregation that women all of a sudden realized. What is this segregation? There is man who has to perform certain activities outside and there is a woman who has to perform certain activities inside the house, not being paid anything. This type of segregation was seen across the world. In order to fight this particular thing, there was a new type of approach and that is the gender and developmental approach that emerged in the 1980s which aimed to redefine the traditional gender roles and its expectations. So women usually are expected to fulfill all these household management tasks, home-based production as well as bearing and raising children and caring for their family members. It is this idea that they were against that and that is why they came up and fought against this particular idea as well. Then over the years, the fight has gained momentum over with varying goals depending on the amount of patriarchy that is prevalent in that particular society. So what started off with feminism came up with suffrage of movement in Britain and ultimately gender and developmental approach and finally in the current generation, what we have is this particular me too moment. So what we got to understand is various instances from multiple periods, multiple phases, multiple times we have seen people, women inspired and it is this collective wisdom that have come together and have asserted their very rights. Now let's try and understand what this me too that is presently there in this current generation we are speaking about. This is basically a movement against the sexual harassment and sexual assault. An American an activist called as Tarana Burke began using this particular phase from the year 2006 and this particular phase was also popularized by American actress Alisa Milano in the year 2017 on Twitter. According to the author, in this particular article, this Me Too movement is a landmark movement. Why? Because according to the author, she says that there have been few men who have been using their positions in the corporate world, the government, the private sector, as well as in multiple other sectors using their position to extract sexual favors from the women. The women were in an uneasy position. Why? Because they could not voice their opinion against this particular person or the head of that particular organization 
Why? Because she could lose her job. So as a result, this particular person subjected to number of lewd remarks, suggestive behavior and assault and this was not penalized for number of years. As a result, this particular Me Too movement became a transformation. Why? People were able to come right now and voice their opinion against this particular head of the private organization, the government organization or any organization which is subjecting that particular woman to sexual assault as well as sexual ludicrity. In this particular parlance, she takes the example of Tanushri Datta at the Indian level. So what she says is, in India, Tanushri Datta became an anchor. She opened the doors of floodgates because Tanushri Datta voiced her opinion. There were number of other women who faced similar instances has given courage to number of women to be able to come out in the public forum, speak up against all these men who have been tormenting them and even coercing them into some compromising situations. So what the author currently speaks is that all these women who have been victims of sexual assault because they were not able to take on this powerful men are now able to take on via the social media. So this has been a big boon to the feminism. Why? Because when there is this particular woman who is voicing her concern against this particular man, this is acting as a deterrent factor. Why? Because this particular man will be very cautious in the future because this is more to do with his reputation. This is more to do with his client base. This is more to do with his business. This is more to do with the money that is coming through the business. In case there is a woman voicing an opinion against this particular man, then he has all his reputation in stake. So he'll be very cautious going forward in case he has to conduct this particular activity in the future. So this particular Me Too movement has become a huge platform, successful platform in helping women to be able to express their ordeal as well as find solidarity and support. However, this article currently has been able to voice certain personal concerns as well. So what the author says here is, there have been number of women who have been in relationship in the past. This was a mutual relationship. There was a mutual consent between the man as well as the woman. So there was no abuse conducted by the man on this particular woman. But with time, there would be differences and on this particular differences, they break up as well. So because there have been breakups and now they are in disagreement and they're not in mutual relationship together, this has led to scoring up of personal agenda. Now that they are not in a relationship, they are spewing venom against this particular man for no harm done by this man to this particular woman. So majority of the women are choosing to lash out against the ex-lovers as well as blame them for harassment while all these men would not have done anything against this particular woman. In fact, former Chief Justice of Bombay High Court, so Sujata Manohar went on to say that many women are misusing the Me Too movement to shame men on social media and to settle personal score. These type of women are doing a disservice, disfavor, damaging, causing more harm to the women than the men can cause. Why? Because this Me Too movement is a landmark movement where women would be able to come out and voice their opinion against the sexual assault perpetuated by few men. But because of these type of women, this would create a suspicion in the future where people would start distrusting this particular movement. So what the author currently says is that this Me Too movement has brought about major transformation, has helped number of victims and it has also put these men who are actually perpetrating crime on the women behind bars as well as questioning their own reputation. This has also ensured that this is acting at the deterrent. So going forward, what we need to do is strengthen the process at the work place and also bring a legal framework to this particular Me Too movement and all those women who are planning to score some personal agenda, personal settle the personal scores will have to avoid it because this type of suspicion will create a disservice to the women is what this article all about. Consider the following statements. Anthrax is a disease 
caused by the gram negative bacteria known as bacillus anthurus hepatitis a is also a bacterial disease which of the above statements are correct the answer to this is none why because anthrax is a disease that is caused by gram positive bacteria and also remember hepatitis a is a viral disease and not a bacterial disease why have we picked this up because there is an article about it so we are discussing about it also kindly read about the gram positive bacteria and the gram negative bacteria and the differences between the same as well let's look into the next practice question which port in the country recorded highest sea level rise in 50 years the answer to this is diamond harbor in west bengal let's look into the explanation so according to this particular article of the major ports in india diamond harbor in west bengal located at the mouth of river hooghly has recorded the maximum sea level increase according to the data that had been tabled by the ministry of earth sciences this is followed by kandla port in Gujarat then it is followed by Haldia in West Bengal and this is followed by Port Blair as well consider the following statements the Duncan passage separates South Andaman from Little Andaman the Panchal channel separates Little Nicobar from Great Nicobar which of the above statements are correct the answer to this is one only why because it is not the Panchal channel which is separating the Little Nicobar with Great Nicobar but it is the Press channel that is present. However, the first option is correct as shown in the picture. Let's look into the next practice question. Banjaras during the medieval period of Indian history were generally the traders. Let's look into the main practice question. Locking up the carbon from atmosphere in trees, ground vegetation and soil is one of the safest ways to remove carbon. Comment. So kindly look into this particular question. Women beset with multiple problems from lack of empowerment to sexual violence have always found solace in periodical movements providing the voice to the unheard. This should be utilized for furthering ambitions of equality and not settling personal hatred. Illustrate with example and also suggest measures. So we have discussed about it. So kindly write all your answers on the comment section so that you guys can have a pure review and also come up with some constructive criticism if required. So this is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.